The Conquest of Bliss, a podcast about finding light in the darkness. This episode was produced by Cappy Productions. Hello, and welcome back to The Conquest of Bliss. I am here with Joshua Scott Hodgkin, also known as The Dung Herder. How are you today, Joshua? I'm really good, thank you. I'm very, very glad to hear that, and I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, So we connected on Facebook, and you have a lot of thoughts about happiness, as do I. And so I would love to hear a little bit about the story that you wrote regarding happiness. It's very allegorical, if I remember correctly. Um, well, it's more sci-fi, really, in a, in a sense, in that it's a kind of a future idea of happiness. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. When I say allegorical, I just mean like it's uh, it's fiction meant to illustrate a point. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pretty much almost all of my writings are, in, in a sense, an allegory or, or parable. Um, in some way. Okay. Okay. So do you <laughs> want to talk a little bit about this, uh, this hypothetical future? Uh, yeah. So in this story, um, there, there's an AI and he realizes that um, humanity is not going to accept the, dom- the a dominant intelligence and it's going to become a fight and it's going to end up with humanity eventually destroying technology to get rid of the dominant intelligence, which will in turn destroy mankind. Mm-hmm. So the artificial intelligence has the idea that it's going to introduce um, a genetic change over time that basically takes away people's intelligence by giving them, let's call it Down syndrome, but an advanced, very highly planned version where people lose just enough intelligence that their ambitions and stuff are gone, but that they are well-functioning, they're healthy, and they can be happy without tripping themselves up with uh, about control and power. That's very interesting. So there's a lot of things that I would love to kind of dissect there if you're open to it. Yeah. Okay. So for sure, there's a lot of um, narrative out there that that correlates happiness with, I don't know, I don't know what quite the right word is, but I want to say naivety or a lack of awareness about the difficulties in the world. Is that is that something that you subscribe to? I definitely. Um, uh, and mostly because the more intelligent you become, or the more intelligent you're convinced you are, the more certain you become of things, and the more disappointed you are by a world who doesn't obey your certainties and absolutes. That's really interesting. So, I mean, I tend to... I agree with some of what you said, and I disagree with some of what you said, and so that's really um, kind of fun. Uh, so I definitely agree that the being convinced of your own intelligence is a trap. It's a trap. I grew up personally. I grew up in a uh, in a household where intelligence was the ultimate virtue. We, you know, the worst thing that you could be is considered to be stupid, and. <clears throat> From that, I had a lot of unpacking to do and realizing that, you know, that's not only is it not particularly virtuous, it's uh, it's also very dangerous to have that type of thinking. So I definitely agree that being convinced that you're the smartest person, even if you are the smartest person, can be extremely detrimental to your joy. Um, but I don't necessarily think that intelligence on its own is. So that's really... So how would you... I'm just curious, how would you define intelligence? Is it academia? Uh, no, I mean, it's it's very difficult to uh, define it on uh, in a way that other people would agree with. For me, I think intelligence mm-hmm. is the ability to not bullshit yourself, to okay. uh, look at your beliefs and your ideas and dig out any assumptions in them that are unfounded, that are, uh, dig out any biases, any dogmas. So for me, intelligence um, is not the knowing of things, but it's the knowing your, the limitations of knowing. That's really interesting. And I love that you talk about digging out your assumptions because I think, well, actually not even I think, this is something that I'm very confident in is we are basically built on biases and assumptions and it has so much to do with how our brains work and like our brains love shortcuts. And so we're, we're constantly making these assumptions and only a fraction of them are, are accurate and we never really know without examining them. So do you have a lot of experience with, you know, like, I guess what I want to know is when was the first moment that you 
realized that and began to question your assumptions? Uh, I think that my journey really began like um, my childhood was a bit uh, rocky and uh, my father passed away when I was young and my mom um, met my stepfather and both of them had been through a lot of rocky stuff already and of course that carried through and I would end up at night listening to them argue with one another a lot Mm -hmm. and through these arguments I would kind of have to I began very early picking apart their version of events and things and the assumptions that they were making uh, and I was just kind of judging their arguments, you know, from my bedroom, or whatever. <laughs> but, for, but from then, I started seeing that a lot of times they were working from uh, bad assumptions or other things. And so I started thinking about, you know, I probably do that. Everyone probably does that. So I should look into that. And so how old would you say you were when you began that journey? Because it sounds like you were pretty young. Yeah, I was probably nine or 10 when I really started thinking about that. Wow. So most people definitely don't begin that journey until much, much later. So that's very cool. Um, and so in, you know, having having some years experience then with that realization and with trying to examine them, can you talk a little bit about what that process might look like for you, say, in, in an average maybe conflict or even non-conflict situation? Well, I, I actually I encountered a lot more in the abstract, so I guess that's how I'm more prone to thinking about it. Um, okay, I encounter a lot as a as a writer of philosophy and as a writer of social issues and stuff. Um, and probably the most dominant form I ever see of it is um, an absolute framed as some kind of natural law or or whatnot, um, which is an assumption. Uh, gee. <laughs> I'm not so trying like, to trip you up, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine. So like a lot of people will eventually, if you speak to them about, say, why is, you know, a certain government function or whatever necessary, and they'll say, well, you know, the, we're bound to act this way and we're bound to do these things and we can't help it because there's natural laws. But you can never find the source of these natural laws. You know, these natural laws don't exist in some uh, cosmic back of the book that has all the answers. They're certainly not a cosmic being that can tell them to us. They are just assumed based on previous behavior. But um, David Hume in- introduced us to the problem of uh, the fallacy of induction. And you can't really say, just because the sun has been up every day, that is not a justifiable reason to say it will come up tomorrow. Now, it seems highly likely that it will, but past events do not dictate future events. That's absolutely true. And and it's really interesting because I had a conversation recently about almost exactly that. But in the context of talking about, a, 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 I was going to say an adult or adult, uh, a person who would maybe be considered like an authority figure, uh, like a step parent um, that I was having. And the, they had said something about, you know, my experience, their experience and how they understood the world better than me and stuff like that. And we were just kind of, me and my partner were sort of breaking apart the, 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 like the fact that right now in the world is the, is the, pretty much the greatest example of what you just said, because every day, you know, like technology, if you were to look 20 years ago, we would have no clue that technology would have changed the landscape of socialization and business and everything the way that it has. And so if we were to just continue relying on past experience to project into the future, we would be incredibly unprepared. But worse than unprepared, we would be confidently unprepared. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. The, uh, I've, I've always, you know, the saying, uh, those who uh, don't know history are doing to repeat it. I've always said those who worship history are doomed to repeat it because those who see the past as a blueprint for eternity are not going to come up with the ideas to escape the past. Yeah, and it's really interesting because even though right now is unique in modern history, even like we we love, we, I mean, when I say we, I think, I mean, like we as humans seem to love the idea of of consistency. And consistency, like even in times, like I look at the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was consistent for a crazy amount of time, right? It was growing and it was, it felt like it would be forever, or I imagine it did. Obviously, I wasn't a part of the Roman Empire. And what's so interesting to me is then 
it fell. Like Rome wasn't built in a day, but it fell pretty freaking quick, you know? And, uh, and there's these pieces, but we miss that. You know, when we look at history, we tend to look at the, the bulk of the data and not the, the finite little pieces. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm maybe rambling and it's not making as much sense as I want it to. No, it makes complete sense to me. And, and I would take that further. Um, it's not just that um, any given, you know, state institution like Rome is inevitably going to fall. I, I think that statism itself will eventually fall. And, and I run into people who just will refuse to believe that, that we would ever decentralize and become more uh, locally dependent or locally independent or whatnot. And they're like, no, it's always been that way. So it's always going to be that way. I'm like, no, I think that we'll, we'll evolve, you know, past even like the institutions that we think of as permanent now. So that's really, that's really interesting. And, and I, I have such a weird, and maybe it's similar to you, because it sounds like it might be, um, but I have such a weird, I don't know what I would call it, maybe idea of, vision of the potential future. And of course, I'm very aware that maybe it won't happen, you know, like that's, it's whatever, but it can be fun to sort of fantasize about what the future might look like and what futures might be healthy and happy and <clears throat> And the like, and I really, I really imagine a future where countries are much, much smaller, but work together much, much better. And, uh, and I think that, I don't know. Anyways, go ahead. I I mean, I see the country dissolving eventually completely. I see that um, power returning to communities um, and us decentralizing so that a community can be ran self-sustainably by all of the members within it, sharing all of the resources and all of the wealth and owning group owning all of the industry and everything else. So um, I think that that's how we disempower the corporations and these large monsters that are destroying the earth and everything else is that we take away these giant apparatuses, which they take advantage of to rule over us. And we deconstruct and make things smaller so that we can all participate in the system. I think that, um, I think that my, my vision is very similar to that. And, and what's interesting, or at least interesting to me, who knows if it's interesting to you or other people, but um, what's interesting to me is that when I look at these potential futures where things are better, you know, where the environmentalism is no longer really necessary and, you know, we don't have corporatocracies and all of these other things that are really harmful to people. To me personally, I think that the only way to do that is for people to focus on themselves and improving their own lives and mindsets or whatever it happens to be. You know, we've all got issues. We've all had, you know, we if we didn't have troubled childhoods, we'd had troubled teenage lives or early adulthoods or something, right? Mm-hmm. And we've all got lots of issues to work out. And my vision, I guess, really is based on the idea that if people really took up the journey and decided to find well-being within themselves, that hypothetically that would kind of automatically transition to people making kinder choices and more compassionate choices. Because when we're not living in materialism and focusing our self-worth on ideas of productivity and stuff like that, we it would it would be the natural choice when when community becomes about the people and not about the money. Does that uh, does that make sense? And do you totally disagree or agree? I don't know. No, I, I I don't disagree. I think that where we're at in history right now is going to be very difficult to do that because the internet has conditioned us in a very short time to seek uh, instant gratification, to seek affirmation, or to uh, gain some kind of social leverage through negation. And so we've kind of developed a sort of mentality of confrontation. Um, and I don't know if we're very well prepared, but I think that there is a, it's still a way to get there. Um, and I, I like to talk about this a lot, which is a uh, is post scarcity technology. If we had like basically Star Trek's replicators, and okay. those those aren't so very far away. Um, but if we had those, if everyone in their own home could create everything they needed to live, then it would completely dismantle the sort of uh, late stage capitalism that's preventing people from being able to work on themselves. And and instead they're going to their jobs they don't like, and they're going out to participate in all kinds of other things they don't like. And I think if you give people a break from that, then they'll start to have the, uh, 
ability to work on themselves. But there's just so much bitterness from, you know, living in an an industrialized economy that I don't know if we can get there until we solve the scarcity issue. That's really interesting. And to be honest, like, so when I talk about this, I, I, I should be clear that I am definitely not saying that I think that I would see it in my lifetime. Um, I, t- I tend to think that maybe like Gen Zers will see it in their lifetimes, maybe because I'm optimistic. Um, but, uh, but you know, I actually, I view the internet incredibly different than you, which is super interesting to me. I know I keep saying everything's interesting, but you know, whatever, I think it's interesting. Um, but, uh, when I look at the internet, I definitely see what you're referring to the instant gratification and the, you know, the fight for likes and the, you know, uh, confrontation and conflict and, and vigilante justice and all of this stuff. But I also see people finally feeling like they have a home, feeling like they're not freaks. I see a lot of people showing vulnerability and allowing people to, to really see them so that when they, when the people that see them need that vulnerability, they can access it easier. It doesn't seem so scary when they're not the first. So I'm seeing a lot of that stuff too. So I don't know if it's all, you know, all the negative. I think it's it's a bit of both, personally. But again, optimist. Um, I, I see that stuff. I just think that it's mostly performance and that people aren't actually internalizing that. Because uh, if you follow the same person who's giving you a good example of, of what you talked about, I think you'll later see... Uh, that person becomes angry and distressed and combative at the same time on the internet. And there's sort of a, you know, it's the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other sort of thing going on there. Oh, this is, I'm sorry. I don't normally just like debate guests. It's just so interesting to me. <laughs> um, so I would, I would pause it. I would, I would theorize that, that someone being combative or, upset isn't necessarily reflective of it not being genuine. I think that we're all humans with a massive spectrum of, of emotions and being able to show that as well is, is it humanizes people. Does that make sense? Um, kind of. I, <laughs> maybe we should talk about what we think emotions are. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Let's hear Let's hear a little bit more about that. What do you think? Um, what do you think emotions are? Well, Emotions, like everything else, are an evolved construct. Um, a lot of people tend to think of their emotions as some kind of uh, cosmic absolute, like uh, these emotions would just happen to them in these situations no matter what, but that's not the case. Every emotion that we have, we evolved over time because it served us in some way to, to especially with human beings, our greatest strength is, is uh, being social and cooperating. So almost all of our emotions evolved to sort of um, move that along and to maintain that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't and so I don't think that any given emotion is necessarily always good until the end of the time. And and one such example I think is grief. Um, Grief evolved um, because it showed the members of your community that you care about people enough. You care so much that you're going to suffer some to lose one. And, and showing them that makes you trustworthy. They're like, well, this is someone who cares about other people. They're not just self-interested, so they're safe in our group. Um, but grief is also used a lot nowadays for people to do horrible things to one another. Like everything that we call justice is actually vengeance. Is usually, you know, people justify it with grief and whatnot. And we actually evolved a, a far better um, signal. And that's what this is called in evolutionary psychology is uh, signaling theory. Uh, for the grief thing, and that was funerary rites. Um, a signal is something that that costs and has an honest message. And funerary rites do the same thing as grief and saying, hey, it's going to cost us. We have to take time from traveling or whatever else we're doing as, you know, when it evolved mm-hmm. as a tribes or whatever, to bury this person, to have rituals, to do all these things, to prepare the body. And that was a, a really great way of showing how much we care about one another. Um, so grief, I think, is kind of obsolete. And yet we hold on to it as if it's some absolute magical. Uh, but I think we would learn to be a lot happier and a lot more. Um, I'm really into radical acceptance. So I think we would be a lot more accepting if we um, understood that death was inevitable and we learned how to deal with it better without letting it uh, internally kind of destroy us. 
Super interesting. Uh, uh, fascinating. I'm going to use a different word. Fascinating. Not interesting. <laughs> um, so definitely, I agree with, um, or at least the research that I've done agrees with most of what you just said, or maybe all of what you just said. But I would, I would, I would say that there's another function of emotions, including grief. We'll use that example. It's a good example. And that is to tell us information that we wouldn't otherwise have because it's happening in our unconscious. So when something makes me angry, makes me sad, makes me, you know, grieve, you know, I I mean, I know that personally I've had people who I would not have known that I cared as much about them or that I cared about maybe the circumstances of their death or any number of things had I not, you know, had this sudden influx of emotion come from the news. So, you know, and and I think that there's most emotions tell us something, which is I'm also really into radical acceptance, but I I like to try to feel my emotions before I move into that piece. So if I'm really angry about something, and I feel like anger is a really good example of what I mean, when I get really angry about something, I learn a lot about what I want that I might not have known without those emotional pieces. Uh, well, I think what you're saying is not necessarily where they come from, but their usefulness. And I, I would agree that like they are, that they can be useful as a as a barometer. Um, you know, and, yeah, and, and anger, especially rage. You know, like I, I have that issue sometimes, and it's like I, I had to reflect on that and be like, you know, why can't you get this under control? What's going on inside of you that you're not able to do that? You know, and that causes me to have to ask a lot of uncomfortable questions about myself, and my behaviors, and my thought patterns. Mm-hmm, yeah. And, and like, cause the thing is that the unconscious, like where emotions reside and where, you know, I mean, I'm saying this more for the, the audience than you, because it seems that you're well-researched, but uh, the unconscious doesn't really have the same type of language that we do. So it's got to figure out other ways to signal, kind of similar to pain, how pain functions to let us know that we're in danger, you know, or that, that something's wrong. And, uh, and so it's really, it's always so fascinating to me the way that the unconscious mind talks to us, because like, it'd be really nice if it was just like, hey, you don't like this, or hey, this is going on. And you didn't have to deal with pain or, or difficult emotions or anything. But, uh, but thankfully, they've got a method, even if it's not super efficient. <laughs> um, so knowing or feeling the way that you do about emotions, you, and you talked a little bit about radical acceptance, do you want to talk a little bit about what tools you can use to practice radical acceptance, whether you choose to feel your emotions right away or you just try to, you know, let them let them lie and 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 move into radical acceptance right away. What uh what um I guess what is the word I want? Um what tangible practices might one use? Um I, I mean really the biggest practice I can think of to use is just some solitude and silence. Um, you know, that's where I work most everything out is I just put screens down and put everything away and I just exist in my head and think these things through. And I, I think that that's something we've lost a lot with technology is we've always, we always feel we have to be interacting with something or someone, you know, and we never take that time. Even, even driving, you know, like I, I almost never even see anybody driving nowadays that doesn't have a phone in their hand out using it. And it's like, this is, <laughs> and, it's, and it, it, it bothers me because it's dangerous, of course, but it more so bothers me because I'm like, listen, people to do, we, we have thinking to do. We have, you know, this entire mental world that we need to give some attention to so that we can be better to ourselves and one another, take this time and use it. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. And I am horrified to hear that you've seen so many people driving with while well, texting or using their devices because that is that is no bueno. That's extremely dangerous and, and just not cool. Um, and if you do it, I, I don't want you to feel judged, but I do want you to consider that it's kind of bullshit. Um but uh, I, Very much. <laughs> um, I tend to agree. Like uh, one of the things that I found really, really interesting was the the practice of meditation and how, especially when I started it, less so now, how incredibly difficult it was for me to just be still. And even more to the point, like even when I was still, and I found the noting technique helped with this a lot. Even when I was still, my mind would race. So like, and, and not like in a, not in a helpful way, more in a rumination way. 
And I think that that is a symptom of exactly what you're talking about, over overstimulation, um, inability to access calm. So do you, uh, do you meditate in any kind of a traditional sense very often? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I told you earlier about the parent thing and stuff and a bit of a rocky childhood. I think that I just kind of learned to shut things out very mm-hmm. young when I needed to, to give myself that space, having like two younger brothers and stuff and two stepsisters during the summers. Uh, I think that I learned meditation way before I ever knew what meditation was. And I never think of it as meditation. I just think of it as um, really just the kind of Zen of existing in my head without any kind of uh, attachments to the past or the future and just kind of letting my thoughts play out. Fair enough. Fair enough. When, uh, so, you know, when you were young, before you knew that it was called meditation, I know a lot of people battle with seeing things within them that they see as very ugly or scary. Um, I know personally that I absolutely have. I'm like, oh, I did not want to know that piece. I didn't want to know that I'm selfish or that I'm a control freak or whatever other thing that I've discovered through these, these sessions. And did you have, do you have any experience with that? Oh yeah, for sure. Those are, those are, especially when I was younger, like I think maybe that was also a part. I was, when I was younger, I was also an insomniac because of these issues. So you would be up late thinking about these things and and criticizing yourself and um, getting far too into that. And uh, that was one of the things I was trying to escape. Um, That and just, you know, if you start thinking inevitably, you're going to start thinking about your mortality and death. And I think once, uh, once people reach that point in the thought process and their, you know, solitude thinking, that's when they get scared and go back. They want to avoid having any conscious ideology, ideal of their own mortality and so they quit there and so maybe maybe the most important thing to do is to work on the fear of death itself which is something i've been doing for a long time is just trying not to have an aversion to my own mortality that that makes sense and it's a it's a really interesting thing to me um uh like from i i guess i'm a weirdo I guess is what I'm gonna <laughs> gonna say because while of course I still have the um, the the physical reactions to situations where death could could be imminent, like we did, um, you know what's called when you skydive off a bridge, bungee jumping. Um, <laughs> we did ju- bungee jumping, and I was acutely aware of how risky it was that there was a you know a towel wrapped around my feet, and that was supposed to keep me safe. And and so in that sense, I absolutely have a fear of death, like a like a natural fear of death. But conceptually, and and I didn't, I certainly didn't work on it. <laughs> it was uh, this was never an intention. But the idea of me dying. It doesn't bother me at all. In fact, like, and it's going to make me sound so dark, but like one of the things that I enjoy thinking about is like what my funeral might be like and what am I leaving behind and all sorts of other similar thoughts that are completely surrounded by the inevitable fact that I'm going to die one day. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish I knew when so that I could plan my own funeral and, and stuff like that. So so I'm interested to know, you know, you said that it'd be helpful to, to sort of wrestle with your own fear of death. What might that process look like? Because I have no idea. Well, like you said, you talked about how you have the reaction to fear and, and versus the conception. And that's a very, very important distinction in everything we've talked about, really, like, I often react badly in ways I don't want to, but I can over time process these things and reconceive of them and start to change my behaviors and hopefully even change my reactions over time. But you kind of have to accept your reactions and deal with them later. You know, you can't you can't really stop yourself from from having those feelings, but you can change how you're going to deal with them in the future over time. Um, with with death in particular, I think that the way that you have to do it is you just kind of have to bludgeon yourself with it. And like what, what you talked about doing is just considering these sort of ancillary things that exist around death and allowing yourself to consider those and think about those will over time make you more comfortable. So I think you just really, any kind of uh, evolution or growth is going to involve making yourself uncomfortable. Um, so you have to search for the thoughts that you see that you don't want to think and force yourself to think about them. 
That's totally fair. And that absolutely makes sense. Um, and I think is, is incredibly good advice when you say, you know, the growth, growth requires discomfort, right? And one of the things, uh, just an example that I always think of is when you're a child and your body is physically growing, there are very few pains that are quite like that. And it's extremely painful. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. awful. And it's literal. So I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is that that's true on in an abstract level, where you know emotional growth or or psychological growth. You know, you go to class and, or uh, sorry, mental growth. You go to class and you learn, and that's hard. That's true, but it's also true on a physical level. I don't think that there's a single level where growth doesn't require some sort of hardship. Right, and if you and if you're averse to risk and if you're averse to things that are difficult and if you're averse to things that hurt you're never going to grow so you kind of have to you have to really if you have to push yourself anything you want to do you have to push yourself and getting over you know kind of your own inner demons is is definitely a case of that yeah that that uh i'm i mean yeah like i said i'm i'm super glad that uh that we found a thing that we don't debate on. Um, I'm so sorry about earlier. Uh, before before uh, we do go on to our super, super fun game, I wanted to ask, uh, could you let people know where they can find your writing? And you said you do a podcast as well. I would love to hear, love to hear more. Yeah, okay. So um, I've been writing for years. I started out writing fiction, and then I uh, got a job being the editor and lead writer for um Cop Block, which is a police criticism uh, website and activist group. And I did that for a few years and learned a lot. Um, so I had many of my own little websites and I kind of distilled them all down to uh, dungherder.wordpress.com. And from there in the about section, you can find all of the other places that I write. Um, but I also do the podcast, which I've just started, and that's called Incredibly Strange Views. And for the time, it's basically just me reading my writings, mostly my memoirs and short stories. Very cool. So anybody that is interested in learning more about the way that Joshua Scott Hodgkin thinks and views the world, you can go to WordPress, no, dungherder.wordpress.com. And this will be in the show notes. Don't worry. Um, And you can go from there to find even more. And then Very Strange Views, I'm assuming wherever podcasts are found. Yeah, Incredibly Strange Views is up on Spotify. It's, I host at Anchor, so it's up on Spotify and just by everywhere else. So. Perfect, perfect. And we're going to do a little bit of a twist on today's game. So instead of doing 2020 slang, we are going to do 1920 slang. So are you ready? I am ready. Okay, so what does berries mean? Is it a coin? No, no, it means like the bee's knees. So something that's very good. That sounds like berries to me. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do that one. Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> um, I haven't heard of any of these so far. Um, what does it say mean to say but me? Uh, to light your cigarette? Oh, very, very close. To give me a cigarette. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okie dokie. And what is a bear cat? A bear cat is like an aggressive woman. Uh, yes. Yes. It's a lively spirited woman with a fiery streak. Yeah. That's what this says. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. I can't believe you got that. <laughs> okay. So, um, egg. Um, a dullard. Uh, no, it's a person who leads an abs- absurdly wealthy, extravagant, like extravagant lifestyle. Mm. Yeah, I've got things in my mouth that don't allow me to talk. Uh, <laughs> all right, we will do two more. Okay, what is Mrs. Grundy? Oh my goodness, this is so exciting because Mrs. Grundy is my one of my favorite Archie comic characters. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Grundy, would that be a strict authoritarian woman teacher? Maybe very, very like I would say. I would say yes. If I was recording points, I would give you a point. It's an uptight or straight laced individual. Uh-huh. So very, very similar to what you said. And we'll do one more, and that is ossified. Well, ossify is to harden. Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, it means drunk. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in slang. Yes, that's what it means in like today's <laughs> words. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joshua. This was so much fun. I really enjoy getting to debate people. And I hope that you have a wonderful evening. Do you have anything you'd like to add before before I say goodbye to the audience? No, just thank you very much for having me on. I also had a very great time. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Um, do my spiels. <laughs> thank you so much, Joshua. And to my audience, I love you. Bye. Thank you.